So what I'll do in the next 40 minutes, um, and I'll try to stick to that time, to really go through the various themes that I've written in, in, in my book about, and it's a wide range of themes. Um, you know, I've spent 40 years to um, study this, and um, despite the, the potential concern that some people had that this is way too many different aspects of brain gut interactions, hopefully at the end you'll see this is in some ways all, all connected and makes the, the, the brain gut, now brain gut microbiome connection, really a vital part of our health and uh, well-being. So I, I talk about this in my book. So my first gut-based decision was not to stay in the family tradition of making fancy candies and chocolates. Um, <laughs> I've probably indulged on, uh, on high sugar diets for a long enough time and have completely withdrawn from that. But um, um, at about the same time, um, the, the, the model that uh, medicine had of the human body and health and, and, and disease was really the sort of the steam engine type um, um, metaphor. Um, just as we, as humans, we always use our technical accomplishments at a given time to model uh, how we understand our, our body and uh, biology. So this was a very mechanical uh, construct where different parts did very specific individual sections. Uh, if something broke down, you would treat that specific part or with surgery, you would take it out and now, re and now replace it. And this model still persists in, I would say, in medical school to a large degree. Um, it also persists in many um, um, uh, physicians that, um, you know, that are um, now in, 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 in practice. It's gradually breaking down because of several reasons. I'm just going to mention a, a few of those. So one is sort of the discovery, the exponential discovery of and a generation of, of knowledge about our brains. Um, that has moved rapidly away from the old-fashioned way that there's certain regions in the brain that do individual things. And if you have a tumor in one, then only one thing changes. So now the concept is the, the brain connectome. Every part of the brain is interconnected with each other. And there's a large effort to um, sort of dissect this. So the brain connectome is clearly one of the things that is driving uh, our reassessment of, um, of how we understand uh, the biology of our body. And one thing that has, to, to a large degree, has driven all this development, that we no longer have to rely on simplistic concepts and models, is the exponential growth of um, computers and supercomputers, the generation of massive amounts of data from every aspect of our um, from our body and our brain, and the capacity of these computers to put this all together with machine learning approaches and detect patterns in it that we didn't really hypothesize before based on our limited understanding. So many of the experiments that have been done, still being done, are very linear ideas that if you isolate point A and look at point B, then if you do something to point A, something changes to point B. That's not how the organism works, and that's not how the supercomputers work. So we have come up with, um, with an understanding of um, so one system that has particularly lent, it, uh, uh, lent itself to this, this new concept is how the brain and the gut and the microbes, the 120 microbes that live in the gut and they live in other places as well of our body, but in the large intestine, the largest, the highest density and uh, largest number. Um, so this is... Um, is, is all of a sudden driving um, sort of an, an explosion of, of interest in these complex interactions that play a role in, in, in health and disease. So this is not just um, pretty pictures, but it's also we, we understand now um, that not only is the brain organized in these multiple interacting networks, but also the gastrointestinal tract. And if, if you see on the left lower, um, portion of the slide, uh, th there's been tremendous breakthroughs and discovery of all these individual cells that are shown here, that are basically all in the gut wall. So this very thin thing that surrounds your, your gut contains all these different cell types from the largest part of the 
body's immune system, <clears throat> the largest part of the nervous system outside of the brain, 100 million neurons sandwiched in between the layers of your gut, um, um, and, and many other cell types. And in addition, on top of it, you see <clears throat> the, the actual lumen of the gut with the microbes that have really drawn the attention of people on the system. <clears throat> and, and what's unique about this is that every single cell that's outlined here that has pretty much been studied in isolation is communicating with each other. So this is clearly another connectome where it's just beginning now, people have characterized in image cells, but we're just beginning now to identify the, how these cells work in combination in a, in, a, in a network. And it's, so you have 100 trillion microbes that are non-human that communicate with this very complex human system in very intricate connections. Um, so, I mean, I've been interested in looking at the brain-gut axis for most of my career. Uh, for about 30 years, this hasn't really generated much interest outside of a small group of so-called neurogastroenterologists who are interested in um, um, what used to be called psychosomatic disorders like irritable bowel syndrome or functional gastrointestinal disorders. The last 10 years has seen an explosion of interest. Now, all of a sudden, everybody is a self-declared um, um, brain gut microbiome expert. There's multiple, there's multiple books out there, and every part of medicine and science has now incorporated this, this system as a fundamental, potentially fundamental influence on anything from psychiatric disease to metabolic disease. And it's, it's also kind of amazing that in, the, in our traditional view of, of medicine, of health and disease, the, the, the microbiome did not really play any role in it. So even though if you put all, because we obviously can't see it, we couldn't culture it, <clears throat> still can't culture the majority of these organisms. So only with these modern sequencing techniques and the affordability, because it became so inexpensive to do that, was it possible to detect this system. And it's, some people have referred to it as a forgotten organ. So all our models of disease and health really been made without in taking this into account. It's kind of remarkable that some things really work in, in medicine by leaving one organ out. On, on the other hand, in many diseases, um, we, we have really failed to develop new and effective therapies, such as depression, many of the brain, uh, brain disorders, but also irritable bowel syndrome, which is still sort of um, you know, more art than, than science, the way it's being treated and understood. And you can see from the comparison, it's a fairly, it would be a fairly large organ, I mean, larger than, than the brain, kind of comparable to, our, to the liver. Um, what's even more amazing is, so not just the numbers that, uh, how many organisms are there, but actually what their capabilities are. And this is kind of the most puzzling, really, that um, in comparison to our 20,000 genes, um, there's some 9 million genes that these microbes contribute. So 360 to 500 bacterial genes for every human gene. People have always wondered why 20,000 genes would be enough to create the complexity of, of, of our organism. Um, but we have sort of this vast reservoir of additional genes that, <clears throat> that, that the microbes can use to produce things, new, new things that have not been have not happened in evolution. Possibly one of the reasons why they can adapt to these dramatic changes in, that, have, that, that have occurred in, in, in modern diets and all the medications we put in ourselves. Um, so the fact that we can deal with this has a lot to do with the ability of these, of a nearly unlimited ability of these microbes to, to, to deal with it. So what do they do most of the time? Um, so without getting into the details on top of it, you see that they were able to break down, um, um, it's listed here for starch, but any of the carbohydrates, the undigestible carbohydrates that we eat with, with plant-based foods that our human small intestine can't break down and digest and assimilate, the microbes can break this down into um, smaller units like these short-chain fatty acids, um, um, 
also proteins into uh, amines and phenols. Um, <clears throat> and that's clearly probably one of the most important functions why we have them, because it allows us to break down things and our ancestors who didn't have fire to cook things. So raw vegetables were even more dependent on, and plants, on this digestion by the, uh, by the microbes. They also do other things. So for example, they break down um, molecules like these lignans into estrogen-like molecules. Um, they can break down the xenobiotics, which is really drugs and toxins, all the things that <clears throat> evolution has not made us to, um, to, to, to deal with effectively based with, on, on our own human uh, processes. They can use their vast uh, repertoire of genes uh, to break down many of these molecules and, and to detoxify them. And um, so the last sort of overview of this is the, the molecules that come as sort of the leftovers from this process of breaking down things that we in ingest that can't be absorbed in the small intestine. The leftover <clears throat> is also not wasted. So some, some of these molecules, like the short chain fatty acid, can be absorbed um, in the large intestine. And so it's a, a harvesting of calories that normally would be lost. Um, so just think about... Um, our ancestors who didn't have all the highly processed foods, in order to survive, they had to have an ability because they were dependent mainly on, on, on plants and uh, plant-based foods. <clears throat> they were able to salvage energy that they then could absorb after the microbes had broken it down. But they do a lot more things. So, for example, they can some of these molecules that they produce during this um, fermentation process can reach the immune system, the brain, the stress system, the cardiovascular system, um, also the nerves within the GI tract, the gut. So virtually it's a factory that um, influences most of our body functions, um, probably not just in the adult, but also during, during development. On the, on, the, on the right side here, you see a list of substances that are particularly interesting for the communication with the nervous system. So there's so-called neuroactive Substances, often precursors of, um, of our own uh, or analogs of our own uh, neurotransmitters. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you in a minute um, how, it, how it came to that. So how the microbes can produce substances that are so similar to the molecules that our brain uses, and our enteric nervous system uses to communicate. So in the last 10 years only, so this has been a really young field, uh, people have come up with experiments in mice, and, and I won't get, go into the caveats that clearly a mouse is not a human, and you have to be very careful to extrapolate from the, these spectacular findings in, in mice. Um, but they have sort of opened up this idea that the microbes are able to affect our behavior and our, our, our brain and our mind. So one example is that, so there's a technique called the fecal microbial transplant where you take fecal materials from a mouse, put it into a mouse that has grown up without the bacteria, so-called germ-free or notobiotic mouse, and then you look at the behavior of the mouse after the transplant. And so one interesting example that started the whole theory of um, psychobiotics or the ability of these microbes to, to, to affect um, psychological and psychiatric um, phenomena. So they took um, stool samples from a mouse that genetically is a more timid or you know, uh, introvert um, uh, animal based on its behavior. Obviously, we can't talk to these mice. Put it into a, a, a germ-free mouse that um, had a genetic background to be the opposite in terms of its um, behavior and engagement with the environment. And just from their fecal transplant, this animal became the, the same behavioral phenotype as, as the donor mouse. So nothing else was, was changed. So that almost, um, the only way to explain this is that uh, <clears throat> there, there's something in this transplanted fecal material that made it to the brain and, and changed the behavior of this, this mouse. And then um, equally intriguing, this was done with um, a genetically modified mouse, the so-called um, TR5 knockout, that um, is, it has an obese phenotype um, and overeats if, if food is available. 
So when the, 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 the microbes, the fecal samples from these uh, obese animals were given to lean uh, germ-free animals, they turned into the same phenotype that they not only became obese, but they also had completely changed their, their ingestive behavior. They were, as, as long as there was food in the cage, they would not stop eating. Um, so again, something in the fecal material, something that the microbes produce, uh, completely changed the behavior of his mouse in a pretty vital function. So I'm not going to go through all these animal experiments. Um, there's been criticism about this, um, uh, how they were done, if these germ-free mice are really, um, th th I mean, they're not normal, um, if, if that's really the way that, that we can mimic something that has human relevance. But these, exper these experiments have led to many investigations now ongoing investigations in human um, populations. So why are the gut microbes able to, to talk to our brains? Um, is, is that something that, our, that they've learned from us or is it something that the, the, the microbes have at some point during evolution <coughs> have, <coughs> have contributed to, our, um, to, to the development of our nervous system? <clears throat> so, briefly go through several billion years of, of evolution. In the, in the oceans of the world, um, for, for more than three billion years, the, the only inhabitants were these microorganisms, the, the marine uh, animals, and they had uh, the, the marine microbes. And so they had a lot of time to develop communication systems with each, uh, with each other. So of an, an unimaginable time span, really. And think about these, this vast, these millions of genes that each of these microorganisms has. They developed this knowledge, this wisdom from that time that they, that, that they, they lived in the ocean without any animals. Then uh, about 500 million years ago, um, some of the, the first most primitive marine animals, like the hydra, and essentially uh, they, they, they appeared and essentially what the hydra is, is a, is a digestive tube with a nerve net around it. So a floating tube that's surrounded by a nerve net. Uh, you, you can see this here. And um, the, the microbes in the form of algae, the first microbes, um, were then made the decision uh, in, in evolutionary terms to live inside that floating tube. It gave them the, tr the free transport, protection from other factors. Um, and from that time on, this principle in, in evolution has stayed the same. For every animal, uh, an insect and, and fish, um, this principle to have microbes living inside of you, inside your gut, has been maintained. So it must be very uh, valuable and, and, and adaptive. So if a trait like this is preserved over hundreds of millions of years, it must be quite important. Now, just, just to show you why it's so uh, plausible that the gut microbes and the, the gut itself play such an important role in, in our brain health, in our brain-gut axis. So this is an image from these, from these marine animals, the hydra, and what you can see is, is basically the equivalent of a peristaltic reflex, exactly the same mechanism that moves our food through our small intestine. On top of it, you see these nerve nets around it, and if I show you now what, what has been found in the enteric nervous system of the human gut, it's, it's almost indistinguishable from that, from that image. So the same principle has sort of been conserved really over 500 million years, that a, that a nerve net surrounding our GI tract um, is able to, to generate the basic patterns of, of peristalsis. So, and only very recently then, there has been a, um, once animals become polar, to have a head and a, and a tail, a central nervous system developed. And ultimately, it, this evolution came to the highest form of development in the, in the human brain. Um, and, but many of the transmitters and the signaling molecules that, that had come from the microbes in these marine animals then were transferred their genetic material to to the enteric nervous system, also made it to the brain. So uh, uh, evolutionists sort of really like this idea to use this, the same molecules 
have existed for billions of years to use in a very complex computer system in our brain that, that, that we have today. So after this kind of introductory, um, um, in a whirlwind tour through evolution of, of, and giving the rationale for why it's important that um, why the gut microbes and the gut have such a prominent role in affecting our emotions and our behavior, just a, just a couple examples how that and how that um, manifests in in uh, humans. So I like to see this in a very simplistic way that there's gut reactions that come from the brain and go to the gut, and there's gut sensations that go from uh, from the gut to the brain. I'll show you that this is a lot more complicated, but it's almost you can almost look at it as the yin and yang of the brain-gut interactions. And what's also important is that is a completely integrated unit. It's not that you can say, well, in this individual, it's only the gut reaction, and this it's, it's the gut sensations. When you engage this system, it always acts in, in synchrony as a circular uh, generator of both emotional brain functions and also gut functions. So if you start with the gut reactions, there's a lot of pathways, many through the um, autonomic nervous system that go down to the gut. They can influence contractions of the gut, blood flow, uh, secretion of mucus of water. And now we also know that they can directly influence the microbes. So, for example, um, the neurotransmitter norepinephrine that gets elevated when you're stressed, makes your heart beat faster. The microbes have receptors <clears throat> and react to this neurotransmitter. So when you stress, you change you, the microbial uh, behavior. So any, any, um, uh, any emotional feeling like fear, anxiety, anger, possibly happiness, and possibly social connectedness, we don't know the equivalent of these positive emotions because in science you generally study something that has gone wrong or um, is a, is, a, is a disease mechanism. So we know very little about how positive emotions, uh, what kind of signals they sent down to the gut. But just like the, the facial expression that, that everybody recognizes um, um, and the vast immediate by nerve, nerve output from the brain to the facial muscles, so you could recognize any of these faces instantaneously. Keep in mind that the same thing happens at the gut level. So every emotion has a mirror image to the facial expression at the gut level that correspond to this emotion. So the arrows show decreased contractions, the upward pointing arrows, increased contractions. There are, have been shown to be associated with these different emotional states. I mean, this has a lot of implications. So, and also, so when I made this, this slide many years ago, this was still without the microbes. We did not. Now you have to imagine that these emotions are also associated with particular states of, the, of microbial behavior and different products that they produce. So if you eat a meal, if this individual eats a meal here uh, or here or when, when he's happy, the way it's processed in your gut and by the microbes is quite different depending on the emotional state. So I would generally advise not to eat something when you're in any of those negative emotions um, and defer to a time where you feel better. So the other thing is equally intriguing. Um, the majority of information goes really from the gut to the brain. And um, still not 100% known today why there is so this imbalance between what goes down and what comes up. But it's quite well characterized what parts of the, the brain this information gets to. There's a structure called the insula cortex, um, and it goes in in the back part of this um, brain region. And then in the front part, when it makes its way to the front part, it's modulated by all these other factors, attention, affect, stress, and memory. So the information that comes from the gut is modulated, so like an editor of a movie, um, in the front part, and that ultimately results in a, in a uh, conscious gut feeling. So gut sensation is anything that comes up. Gut feeling is when you actually experience it as an emotion. 
So recently I had the, the, the opportunity to see something that looked like a perfect analogy um, to this process. So this was at the uh, Biennale in, in Venice um, and of modern art. So this was one display. Each of those um, little images is a video playing where the person tells their personal story. Um, this looks even more impressive when you look at the in entire display. So there's, there's literally thousands of, of human stories being told uh, by these individuals. You can't, when you look at it from below, you can't really see what's going on. And that's a very similar process of what we think is happening with all information that in every given emotional moment, your gut reacts and the information is being sent up to the brain from the day you're born. And you develop this, what um, um, Antonio Damasio has called uh, the somatic markers, or I, I, like it, uh, I like to call it uh, e uh, emotional video clips that we in, uh, encode in our brain. And if you say that somebody makes a decision based on their gut feelings, it's not necessary that it, you use that slow process. It's a very fast decision making, like it's intuitive. So it's not necessary that your brain goes down to the gut and see how the gut feels and then gets this information. It most likely accesses this vast database that's been stored in your brain, your most personal, um, individual um, body of information that, you, that we all carry around with us in our, in our memories. And um, just like a, a Google search engine or the Amazon search engines um, pulls out, does a, a, a nonlinear computation of what's the most appropriate decision based on all these other um, tens of thousands of experiences that, uh, that you have had. Um, so let's switch gears. So this is sort of the second part of the book, um, which surprisingly to me has actually generated more interest than the first part. So in my career, I found this the most fascinating, that um, how the gut is so intricately connected to to our, uh, to our emotions and our ability to make decisions, but the second part about food and, 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 and microbes and the brain has sort of really become um, a major topic for the, for the lay media, and uh, there's, there's almost nothing you can read today uh, about diet and food uh, without taking this, um, you know, without reading about the, the, the role of the microbes. And in, in a very simple way, to understand this and, and how unique it is. So below now you see the lumen, the inside of the gut, um, on the upper part of this layer of cells, of gut cells. You see some of the other players that are I've shown you earlier, this gut connectome. And I just want to highlight it on a, for a couple of examples how, uh, 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 how amazing this actually is and how it links us with our brain function to um, what we feed our microbes and what we ingest. So after hearing this, you probably will become more mindful when you eat something, all the things that are happening. You're not just absorbing carbohydrates. We have to be worried about gaining weight or uh, um, absorb your vitamins. There's a lot more going on in terms of this information processing. Um, and you could almost say food is... is a, 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 I mean, you can conceptualize food as a carrier of information that, that, you, that you get every time you eat a meal. So um, what you can see here, there's different cells that have been it's oversimplified clearly, that have been identified as playing a particularly important role. Um, and I'll just mention the first two. So the blue one is the so-called uh, enterochromaffin cells, contains 95% or more of the body's serotonin. So it's not in the brain, so if you... Um, I'm sure somebody here is, is on a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, medication for depression. Um, psychiatrists have developed all these medications and prescribed these medications without ever thinking that the majority of this molecule is actually at the, in the gut. Uh, <clears throat> and you can see there's little sort of um, extensions sticking out into the gut lumen. These are called microvilli um, that sample everything that goes on inside the gut and, and moves by. So we know that mechanical forces can activate these cells, but now we also know they have multiple receptors for molecules that the, um, that the microbes produce. And then the second cell, the purple cell, is an immune cell, so-called 
dendritic cell. There's multiple different cell types, but this one is intriguing because it has this tentacle that sticks into the lumen of the gut, has receptors, and again, many of the molecules that the microbes produce um, are located on these, on these extensions. So whatever goes on inside the gut and is changed when you eat something, the, the microbes produce all these metabolites and breakdown products. They act on these cells. Some of them actually, if you have a leaky gut, some of these molecules can go directly into, through the gut wall, this barrier, um, and influence, for example, the immune cells or other cell types that, that are present. And then what I already mentioned on the far right, you see um, this pathway where the brain sends down signals to these nerves in the gut to release the neurotransmitters that we use for, um, like during a fight and flight response or during stress. And these molecules change the behavior of all the microbes in the gut. So if you eat while you're stressed, it will be a totally different scenario here than if you're relaxed and you don't have these, um, these stress mediators influencing your, your gut microbes. So let me say a few words about this, this cell that's shown here in, in blue because that illustrates this even more strikingly. Now you see it in, in, in green. We know just in the last two years, um, and, and I want to emphasize, this is, many of these things are happening, um, have been happening in, in the last 10 years. This is a rapidly evolving area. So you, you see the, this enterochromaffin cell, the serotonin-containing cell, and on the inside of the lumen, the gut with the microbes communicating with it. We now know that 60% of the production of the serotonin is influenced by the microbes by signaling molecules that they produce. So it's, that idea is actually amazing that a molecule that's so essential for our well-being, our mood, um, our pain sensitivity, our sleep, would be controlled to 60% by, by the microbes. And also an insight that we've gained recently is that nerves can make these synaptic, very close contacts with these cells. So when this cell is activated, for example, by a microbial signal, a direct signal goes into our, what's called the limbic system or the emotional part of the brain uh, and has an influence on that. Um, if you put food on top of this, which can influence these cells, so for example, um, food that is high in serotonin, like chocolate, uh, for example, or oysters, will activate these cells to produce these serotonin-stimulating cells in, your, in these enterochromaffin cells. So obviously for psychiatry, this is a, a totally new frontier of discovery, and it's just one cell. So we used to think until a couple of years ago that there's only 20 different cell types, with different hormones, some play a role in satiety and, and in other functions. There's probably hundreds of these different cell types, and all of them respond differently to different signaling molecules from the microbes. Let me also say a couple of things about, the, um, about these immune cells because it's, it's, a, it's, it's also a particularly uh, relevant mechanism in terms of what food does to our health. So these, I mentioned these dendritic cells. So depending on what food we eat, if you eat a food that, uh, for example, that's high in, in animal fats, it will change the microbial populations in a way that... Um, a substance is produced called LPS, so lipopolysaccharide, kind of an inflammatory molecule that can activate these cells, can make the gut leakier, um, and basically lead to what's been called a, a metabolic toxemia or low-grade inflammation um, throughout your body that can affect virtually every organ. It's been implicated in, in cardiovascular disease as a major risk factor, um, also in the degenerative brain diseases like... Uh, um, um, <clears throat> Alzheimer's disease, possibly Parkinson's disease, um, and, and also in, in, in appetite control. In, in this chronic inflammation messes up our regulator in the brain that, that shuts off or that creates satiety, shuts off our, our appetite. So this is what, what happens. So this is the normal interaction um, of, of the microbes with the gut lumen, in yellow is a, a mucus layer that separates us 
from the, the, the microbes. And normally this system is in balance. So what happens with a high-fat diet is this increase of these bacteria that have in their membrane this inflammatory molecule. Um, and <clears throat> this what's called LPS translocation. It transfers, this molecule transfers the gut wall, gets into the systemic circulation, and has been identified as playing a major role in, in many metabolic uh, diseases and has been hypothesized to play a role in neurological diseases as well. So the last part, um, I think I'm almost done with my time. Um, I'll, I'll try to cut the short, even though it sort of has some very nice images in it. Um, so th this, is, um, this idea that the gut plays a big role um, in our health has long been known to, in traditional healing systems, um, traditional Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, uh, Hippocratic medicine, I think we're just on the verge now of rediscovering this concept that the gut is not just there for digestion, but also for overall health. There's a tr tremendous number of books out there. Um, I don't necessarily recommend that you, un unless you have already read them, to, to, to read them now, because um, it's been amazing that every few years new trends come up that um, are not really based on, on science, but you know, authors pick particular things that are particularly intriguing, like the leakiness of the gut, and then base the whole um, story around them. So um, the explosion of gluten sensitivity after the Grain Brain book came out, um, and the popularity now of um, eating high-fat diets, uh, and also this, this sort of paradox that uh, the best thing for us is a clean gut, which means, you know, you clean all the this complex ecosystems of bacteria out of your gut. So none of this really makes, makes much sense. Um, <laughs> in, in my own uh, um, experience, so long before I was interested really, um, so this was during, during college uh, in, in, in these connections, so I had the opportunity to participate in a film expedition to, this, um, to these Amerindians on the uh, Orinoco River in the border between Venezuela and, and, and Brazil. Um, and so we lived with these people and filmed them for about two months. And, you know, it took a, it, I did a journal and wrote down all the things that they ate. Later, I went back and, and sort of people have tried to study this to find out. So essentially what, what they eat is, is a, a mainly a plant-based diet with a small amount of, of, of animal uh, products. Um, so they're essentially the remnants of hunter-gatherers that have, that have lived on the earth for, um, for a very long time. There's other um, populations, small populations in, in, in Africa, the Hasda. Um, and so is, is there a lesson that we can learn from these individuals? So microbiome research, um, kind of amazing to me that some 40 years after I lived there and uh, was involved in making a movie about them. Scientists went there um, and studied the, the gut microbiome of these people. And, and, and in terms of the, <clears throat> um, the native people on the uh, Orinoco River, um, so just from a very uh, seminal study, it was concluded based on the findings that the microbiome of these uncontacted um, people exhibited the highest diversity ever reported in any human group. So they had the, the most intact ecosystem inside. Um, and if you look at what their diet is, um, it's 70, 80% plant-based. So obviously a lot of other factors, the exercise, the long uh, nursing of their, of their infants. Um, but, but I think a very important thing for me was to see that um, um, there must be some connection between what they, what they eat as a regular diet and what their microbes are. And it makes a lot of sense because the microbes, their main function is to break down these undigestible food components. Um, so if you put a lot of these undigested food components into the gut, clearly from day one, um, when you're born, it's pretty clear that this would uh, nurture these, these, these microbes and increase their, their, their diversity. There's still a big question mark, is diversity, the maximum diversity of our gut microbiome, how important is this for our health? Um, 
we only have 40% of the diversity of these, in, uh, um, these hunter-gatherers. Many people believe that many of our current diseases uh, that have increased, um, like autoimmune diseases, um, asthma, a uh, allergies, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, um, possibly autism, are really related to this degradation of that ecosystem that these people um, um, still have in their um, intact um, way. So by looking around in the literature, and I'm, I'm not a dietary expert, I'm a gastroenterologist um, that typically does not get trained in anything that has to do with nutrition, surprisingly. <laughs> um, so what I found is there's diets around the world that are actually similar, um, that not specifically to the things, but to the that that these people eat in, in the jungle or in the in, in the desert in Africa, but that are similar in the composition between plant-based foods and animal-based foods. So this seventy to thirty percent to eighty to twenty percent ratio. So one is clearly if you go to Italy, um, particularly if you go back to the. Um, there's an extensive literature on the Mediterranean diet. Um, you see there's this enormous variety of, um, of plant-based products um, and also a lot of um, fish. And the, the composition of the Mediterranean diet has sort of um, been, has been summarized and has become the basis really of a lot of dietary recommendations. And it's intriguing that it's a similar kind of composition of, of the overall um, the origin of these foods as these hunter-gatherers had. A another important thing is that the small amount of, of uh, animal products that have a high fat, saturated fat content, um, like red meat, um, is actually uh, was a very small portion. Now, this has changed over the years. So the first studies were in the 60s. In Italy, this has clearly changed, um, both in the overall volume of the meal, uh, but also in the change in this ratio of of, of, of animal products or, or, or uh, animal meats and fats to, um, to the other components. Important on the lower, uh, this was emphasized in all the studies that have been done about the health benefits, that there's also lifestyle factors, particularly the social activities around <coughs> meals uh, that's characteristic of these Mediterranean countries. It seems that if you eat that diet from studies in a different context where you've lost the ability to do these rituals, um, to the eating um, within a community, either the family or, or, or with friends, the benefits, uh, the health benefits go down. And there have been many, so I wanted the time to go through this. Some of the best studies in dietary uh, assessments have been done um, with the Mediterranean diet. Some of these studies had to be um, stopped before they ended because the benefit in the in the treatment group that were on the Mediterranean diet was so much higher than the people that uh, did not take it. And there's many reasons why that's uh, the, the case. I've just listed a couple here. Um, so as I tried to explain to you throughout this presentation, um, this high ratio of the plant-based uh, to, to animal-based um, food components, um, this high ratio of plant-based monounsaturated fats to, um, to, 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 the, to the saturated fats from, from animal uh, fats. And most likely this anti-inflammatory effect that these diets have based on some of the things I explained to you from how the microbes interact with our uh, immune system in the, uh, in, in, in the gut. It's not limited to the Mediterranean diet. So I, I personally, um, so spend more time, it's easier to, to, to explore the Mediterranean diet than some of these others, but in a recent interesting article in the Huffington Post, so they provided, uh, this author provided um, uh, evidence that the first four of these were actually, are kind of similar in their general composition um, and, and have been shown to have health benefits. The French diet was called a paradox because obviously the French love to eat um, animal based fats uh, and, and, and meat. Um, and it's not known, is this for genetic reasons? Is it because the quantities that the French eat typically are much lower than the quantities um, that, that other cultures eat? And um, so we don't know this. It's certainly not um, that there's only one diet that, that, that would be health, um, 
uh, health promoting. So I'm just going to go through. Um, okay, so one diet that I've recently experienced personally and on a trip to Korea <clears throat> is the Korean diet. So fermented foods and probiotics are clearly a, a very hot thing uh, these days, it used to be absent from the North American diet as opposed to almost every culture in the world. I think the Koreans probably have the, the record in the variety of these fermented foods. So this was a, a typical <clears throat> dish in a typical Korean restaurant with a main dish shown in the middle and this automatically comes with these 30 side dishes of all kinds of different <laughs> fermented foods. So what we know is that each of those vegetables creates its own probiotic strain. So you can imagine if you eat this diet three times a day, which many people do, um, you get a mega dose of probiotics and that starts in infancy. So I don't know if there's any, any Korean uh, uh, Americans in, in, in the audience, but I've confirmed this in discussions with a lot of my Korean collaborators. This has changed over time. Um, we don't know if this really confers such a dramatic health benefit as um, you would expect from the advertisements today if you go on the internet go, uh, and look at different books that you know taking one probiotic is going to be takes care of all the health problems so it's not <coughs> certainly not that easy so I, I want to stop with this last concept a couple of slides about um, what we're learning, so not just about the microbes per se and the health benefits, but in order to understand the microbes, this, this vast number of these microbes and how they interact with each other and with us, it sort of introduced this ecological view, uh, in my opinion, um, sometimes called the systems biology view, that we, we really look at the connectedness of things and how important they are for our health and well-being. And to just give an example, um, so ecosystems um, on Earth, 7 billion humans, 9 million species, and the balance, the interaction of multiple ecosystems ultimately determine the ecosystem um, Earth. We know that if you look at the Earth, a lot of things are obviously, um, with climate change being the, the most important one, have been changing dramatically, but it's really the, the, the sum of the degradation in many of these ecosystems uh, around us. So, and I could give many examples that are directly relevant to human health. On the microbial level, so this is a, something that we haven't seen before. Everybody has seen the beauty of nature and the systems. We haven't really seen this until about seven to ten years ago. Um, but we know now that these microbes live in all different compartments in our body, not just inside. Um, and I think we, it's time to look at the human body as, a, as an ecosystem similar to Earth and look at health really as the establishment or re-establishment of the, the diversity and, and the balance within that system. Is this going is, is to transform medicine? Um, I'll show you a few answers to, to this question that people in the past have given to developments um, and how wrong they were. Um, so my personal answer to that is yes, it definitely will happen. It happens on all levels in science, not so much in, um, in mainstream medicine. But here are some of the, the answers or the, the, the comments that people made. So particularly relevant is the one on the uh, right lower corner. Um, biological processes are organized into simple pathways. So this was still the dogma for for, for many scientists have not jumped on this bandwagon of looking at the things differently. But this is the new uh, view that the systems view or the um, um, looking at um, a lot of phenomena around us because we can collect all these data. Um, so it's shown for security, air traffic, weather. Um, so m most functions, we, we necessarily don't think about this at the same insights that we get how these complex systems operate, we're now applying um, to understand human health uh, and human disease. So no longer that simple linear model. Uh, so I mean, I could speak a, a, a lot of time about this, but just remember uh, the progress we have made in predicting the weather 
from 20 years ago where it was nearly impossible. That's a good example of, I think, what will happen in, 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 in medicine as well. Um, so sorry for going uh, over time. Um, hopefully there will be a little bit of time left to, for, 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 for questions. So many of the things you want to read this in detail, you know, if you can, you can go to my book and, and do that. Thank you very much for your attention. in our gut deal with um, maybe more non-traditional food, such as all the processed food um, diets have nowadays? Yeah, so this is, this is the big question. And also, it's really a, a very positive consequence of the mi microbiome research because there's now a series of studies that have come out, for example, emulsifiers that are a, an important component of most processed foods, how they can affect the microbes and how they can contribute to the leakiness of the gut and this whole consequence of that. The same thing with some artificial sweeteners. Not, not, every, single, not every single one has been tested, but three different ones have been tested and they have the same um, negative effect on the ecology of, of the gut. Microbiome. So I think what we're facing today is something that evolution has not um, anticipated. Um, really an unexpected onslaught on a massive level with antibiotics, antibiotic tainted food. Um, almost all the meat products contain small doses of antibiotics that have been shown to affect the microbiome. Um, the chronic stress, which we know now affects the microbes and the processed food. So it's not just one thing. I, I think what we're seeing today that some of these diseases have increased exponentially in the last 40 years, while infectious diseases have gone down, um, it's probably a combination, different patterns of combinations of these, all these new influences. But processed food almost certainly plays a major role. The good news is that many companies have realized that um, there's a tremendous counter movement now. People are no longer willing to, are much more aware of this and are trying actively to, to change that, um, some more honestly than others. But so I've, I've consulted with some uh, companies in the food industry. Um, it's actually impressive what they're trying to do. But you know, they always say if they don't do it, then people go and buy the sweet stuff from another company. So it, it's necessary to have an educational process that people stop automatically you know, buying the unhealthy stuff and realize, yeah, it, it may taste better, but it's also bad for my health. Hi. Um, Governor Inslee, Jay Inslee, just declared October Dysautonomia Awareness Month. And I know that I'm meeting a lot of people, including myself, uh, young people in our 20s who are completely taken out of life. I'm on medical leave from dysautonomia. And just, I can't even look at your presentation. I have such bad light sensitivity. Um, and then my other question is, if you have any case studies of um, any psychiatric conditions or people who have had psychiatric conditions that are alleviated by addressing things in the gut, um, if you could share those besides the rats and the mice. And just how is dysautonomia yeah, so connected? Um, the specific example of dysautonomia, I cannot answer to you. I, I do know, uh, you know, many of these functional GI disorders have dysautonomia as part of their uh, pathophysiology. And, um, if you look at the, you know, how the autonomic nervous system is sort of this intricate part of this loop that really involves the, the, the gut and, and the brain and the autonomic nervous system. So many of these things should play some role in, um, in, in, in these disorders. If, that, if the main influence of the gut microbes happens early in life when these systems are basically established, um, and there's a lot of research now prenatally in the first three years of life, how both the brain and the gut microbes are assembled and interact with each other in development, or if that can happen later in life based on you know, a, a lifelong intake of low doses of antibiotics. I can't really answer this at this point. Um, there's a lot of interest now in psychiatry, and uh, there's some studies that have come out that suggest clearly there's a 
the difference in the microbes in patients with major depressive episodes. Um, but if it plays a causative role, we don't know. It, it could also be secondary. If, you, if you're depressed or anxious, you send these different signals to the gut and the microbes and changes that um, most likely, I would say, it's a circular process. You know, you, and we don't really know where it starts. Does it start at the gut with the nutrition or does it start at the, at the brain? And, I mean, the rest would be a long conversation. Do you, do you have case studies in your book? Yeah, there's several case studies in it. <laughs> I'm just wondering, when you talk about the gut, is there a big distinction to be made between the large intestine and the small intestine? And have there been any studies done on people who've had full colectomies? Yeah, because of ease of access, most studies have been done um, for the large intestine. Um, you know, because it's easier to do a, um, an, an endoscopy of uh, the, the end of your large intestine, take biopsies. Um, most of the studies have been done on fecal material, which is kind of a mixture of upper and lower GI tract. Um, underneath this question is, is a huge complexity. So there's microbes at every level, from the stomach, for example, H. pylori is, is an organism that we, we, we look at as sort of really the cause of ulcer disease. It's not really, that's not really true. So Martin Blazer, who played a big role in, in this field, um, sort of really turned, uh, turn against this using antibiotics to eradicate an organism that has lived with us for a long time, probably for some mutual benefits. But there's also, we know in the small intestine, it increases the concentration towards the end of the small intestine. And then in, in the colon, each region in the colon even has different populations that live uh, close to the, to, to the lining of the gut. What we sample in the stool is a mixture of all of this. Um, so we're really at the beginning of understanding the complexity of this. And it, and it will be difficult um, to, to, to dissect this out. It may take a long time to dissect it out. I think what's happening now is, and again because of the computing power and the ability to, to sequence uh, or to analyze vast amounts of data, we, people are now measuring the, the metabolites or the signaling molecules that the the gut microbes produce. You can measure them in the blood, in the urine, in, in the stool, um, and make conclusions based on those signaling molecules. So you don't have to go through these regional um, separations. But uh, yeah, I, I do want to emphasize, we're at the very beginning. This is almost like if you looked at neuroscience, it, we're at the very beginning of understanding the function of individual brain regions. You spoke earlier a little bit about um, there possibly being a correlation between uh, the gut microbes and autism. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, so I, I deal with this in, in the book as well. And um, so autism, it has sort of, there's several indirect suggestions why it would be a brain-gut disorder. So most autistic kids have problems with their digestion, have uh, constipation of abdominal pain, also have a very unique eating um, behavior, very unique taste preferences. Something is, is changed in, in, you know, in the way that, that, that taste is processed. Um, and people have looked at the gut microbiota of, of kids and patients with, with ASD, autism spectrum disorder, and found a variety of different changes. The problem is to control these studies um, based on the diet, based on medications, based on the level of anxiety that many of these kids have is very difficult. So you'd have to study really hundreds of kids. There's a few studies that show a, a trend towards some patterns of how the microbes are altered. The most convincing evidence is really from mouse models of autism. Um, one study published in, um, in PNAS um, that, that showed that maternal immune activation during pregnancy um, can change the gut microbial composition in the offspring, um, and that a particular probiotic could actually reverse those, those changes in, in, in behavior. But again, it's a huge jump from an animal model um, you know, to humans. I, I do believe that microbes play a significant role in this, but what role exactly 
if it's mainly for um, for the gut symptoms, or if it also plays a role in the in in, in the brain abnormalities. I, I mean, again, what I said earlier, I think the the most likely origin of that is during pregnancy, um, where there's a lot of interactions of the microbes of the mother, the nutrition of the mother, um, intake of antibiotics influence the mother's microbiota, and then these signaling molecules gets into the into the fetus, developing fetus, and influences brain development. So I think most of the action probably happens during that time period. Where is the transfer of uh, the, uh, my brain's not working right now. Um, micro, uh, of, of, of these molecules from the mother? Yeah, where does that transfer happen? And do they propagate over your lifespan? Or are you born with most of the things that you end up no, with? No, so, so during, during pregnancy, the, so, like many of these metabolites can cross the placenta and, and go into the circulation of the, of, of the fetus. And then there's multiple ways that this interaction between the mother and the, and the developing infant happens. Um, one is during delivery, so the... the the vaginal the birth canal contributes a lot of bacteria to the infant's gut microbiome. Uh, breast milk has, is associated with unique microbes that also go into the, um, you know, help to shape the, the, the infant. So the, from the mother, there's, there's about three or four pathways where microbes communicate between the mother and, and, and the infant. And clearly the environment that this happens in I said earlier, the food that the mother eats, the stress she's under, the, the antibiotics and medication it takes, all of these are amplified in, in influencing the infant. So it's, it's kind of a worrisome story because particularly for, for, for mothers, um, um, you know, how, how big that influence really is early on in life. Thank you. Hi. I had a question about... Um, Adverse childhood experiences and like functional bowel disorders, and I would love it if you talk a little more about that. Yeah, so this is a topic that we've studied for a long time, long before the microbes came into the scene, um, and it's been worked out really well that adverse early life events are probably the biggest risk factor for chronic, uh, for multiple chronic diseases later on in life. If if you have also vulnerability genes and this. In humans, there's multiple attenuating factors, such as, you know, grandparents. It would be a, a buffer if something happens. If there's marital discord between the parents, or divorce, or death of the mother. Um, but it's it's one of those um, severely ne uh, neglected areas in medicine. So we, you know, we like to pay close attention to the blood pressure and cholesterol. There's no in history taking that that is not taken into account at all, even though. The statistics have shown it plays a big role in, in, all, in all chronic diseases, from heart disease to obesity. To In IBS, that has been studied. Um, clearly, it's not the cause, but it's a major risk factor. If you have that in a family history of anxiety or, or IBS, if you have also an adverse early life event, which doesn't have to be really of use, it can be, as I mentioned, um, an interruption of the balance within the family environment can do that. And so it's, it's a very common thing. Now we know this, the microbes also play a role in this because from what I told you, through the, the sympathetic nervous system during these adverse early life events, it changes the microbes as well and influences and then with the secondary consequences. Um, I learned somewhere, and this may be incorrect, so I'd like to know, that there are genes in microbes that are not present in humans that are necessary for normal human development in the gut cells. Is that correct, that these genes are not endogenous to the human genome but are necessary for development? Um, well, I mean, we can only conclude from these germ-free or notobiotic uh, uh, animals that if, if an, so almost every animal can be, can grow up in a germ-free condition, not just mice or rats or I think even horses and monkeys have been shown, but they, they have, every system in the body and in the brain is, is, is altered in these animals. So um, 
it's not things that are essential for life, but essential for an optimal functioning. And, and again, I think the main, the main influence is, is early in life, is during this development. I, I think for, as an adult, um, I mean, just look at this, um, that our diversity and abundance of microbes has gone down, you know, by 50, 60 percent compared to the hunter-gatherers. We're, we're still, you know, overall pretty healthy. So it's, it's, not, it's not resulted in, in dramatic. Um, um, and what we're seeing now is in the last 40 years, it's something different. It's, it's some, something, um, you know, that all of a sudden we see all these new, uh, new, uh, new diseases coming up. And, but I, I think, um, so it, it's not, they're not essential for, for life, but they're clearly essential for an optimal functioning of, 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 our, of our bodies. And they are separate genes. Yeah. They are bacterial genes. Yeah, they're bacterial genes. And, you know, there's a process... Um, it's called this lateral gene transfer, where, where microorganisms can transfer their, their, their genes onto human, onto mammalian cells. That certainly has happened during evolution. If that still goes on today, uh, we don't know. Another aspect is so these microbes in early development, they can go into our, in the crypts in, in, in our gut lining where the stem cells are and can change through these epigenetic mechanisms what these, how these stem cells develop. So there's, there's multiple ways how they can really interact with us um, and use their, their genetic diversity in, in influencing human processes. Hi. I'm wondering about the role of medications that are pretty much a part of everyday life now, things like over-the-counter painkillers or birth control pills. How mindful do we need to be when we consider taking those type of medications? Yeah, this is also a very important question. So I show you this example. There's this, um, the, so the ability of microbes to, uh, to process what's called xenobiotics, so substances that have not really um, been around in evolution, but that we have been making in terms of many medications. Um, very, very few medications have been assessed for their impact on the on the on the microbiome. Um, so. You know, side effects um, um, and, and the potency of, of, of drugs. So they play a major role in, in the metabolism. So drugs are metabolized in the liver first, then are secreted into the bile and into the, in, into the GI tract. The, um, the gut microbes then process that again, the, these, these metabolites. And so the profile, what you see in your blood of an active drug with its metabolites, is heavily influenced by the gut microbes. So I, I think in the future, when these techniques are um, more affordable, I think we'll almost have, we'll see a, um, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if the FDA came up with a requirement that you have to show what effect does it have on, on, on microbial function. And, uh, so certainly another reason to be very careful. Antibiotics are definitely the example that has been shown. They have the most dramatic effects, um, particularly in when given, when, when, when taken early, uh, early in life, you have long-lasting, lifelong effects. But it probably applies to many other drugs as well, like the psychiatric drugs that um, they, they influence this elaborate system. So, uh, you know, as, as a gastroenterologist, obviously, you know, we do prescribe drugs, but I've been extremely careful in the meantime and try to... Um, particularly for functional child disorder, use non-pharmacological things as much as possible. Because I think we've just gotten used to we can put any chemical into our body, and um, if, if you don't get really sick from it, it's, it's okay. You know, and that's, that's probably not the case. How uh, subject to change is like, your microbiome moving forward, like by eating foods or exercising or something? How much can you change like, your microbes with, in your body? Yeah, how much can you change it? Um, it's a fairly stable system. So once it's assembled early on, early on in life, um, as I said, there's many influences from the mother. And there's molecules in, in human breast milk, these human milk oligosaccharides, or HMOs, that are specifically targeted at um, developing your unique microbiome. And 
once it's established, it's fairly stable. I mean, you can, you know, if you think about how many people take antibiotics, even high-dose antibiotics as, as adults, and, you know, may have a transient diarrhea, but do not so show long-lasting. I mean, a s small number develops post-infectious or post-antibiotic IBS, but... Um, there's a few situations where it breaks down, so... Um, like with the C. difficile colitis, for example, where people in response, certain vulnerable people in response to an antibiotic, the whole system breaks down and uh, with life-threatening consequences. Probably the, the, the baseline microbiome composition plays a role, pretty low in diversity. Um, but overall, it's fairly stable throughout the lifetime. When you change your diet, you don't have to change the microbes but you definitely change the metabolites that they produce. So the health benefits of diet, dietary changes, are not reflected in changing all the components, it's changing what they produce. So it's, I mean, I always like to compare it with an orchestra. The orchestra is assembled early on in life. Once it's assembled, it can play any, any tune, um, and the, the tune is determined by what you feed them. So, Stability, definitely a, a major function of this, just like any other ecosystem. I mean, most ecosystems in the world are phenomenally stable, and the kind of things we do to them before they break down are, have to be pretty dramatic before we really... I mean, we, as humans, we have been able to do this amazingly, but um, both to our external and internal ecosystems, but I would still say overall it is fairly stable. So the last question. Uh, you touched uh, briefly on the uh, supplements, probiotic supplements. Could you just talk a little bit more about if you think they're valuable and is, is there actually a, a downside, maybe uh, disturbing uh, the natural occurring microbial uh, population by, uh, by crowding out and reducing diversity? Yeah, starting with the second question, is that downside? I mean, this. Based on my own practice and, and talking to my colleagues, there's a very small number of patients who take a probiotic and have really significant side effects in terms of the, the uh, digestive system. But that's really the exception. So in general, it's probably one of the safest things that you can do. Um, do they have a benefit that's sort of, um, you know, people have done these meta-analyses of a large number of different studies. and. The, the result of this is that there's a small but consistent benefit for a variety of conditions. Small means about a 10% effect on. Um, that probably varies between different people. If you, you know, each of us has, so we're more different from each other uh, than we're different based on our microbiome than based on our, on our own genes, a lot more dif different. So, you know, if you, if you look at 10 people, they all have a different composition they wouldn't respond in the same way to the same probiotic if you gave each of them the same dose. Um, and that's happening now that people look at these subgroups that like, you fingerprint, and this will happen in the next five years. When you go to the doctor, just like taking your, um, you know, your, your, your blood for, for cholesterol, there will be an analysis of, um, of the gut micro, either the profile or the, or the metabolites that they make. And then based on that, many therapies will be customized or, or personalized. Um, so I think right now the answer is the benefit is relatively small um, since it's not harmful. So for example, if, if you like uh, fermented dairy products, you know, it tastes good, it's healthy from the calcium standpoint. If you get a real, a major health benefit from the microbes that are in it, um, you know, probably wouldn't be worth the expense of doing it un unless you liked it otherwise. Um, the, the big problem I see now is that, you know, there's a lot of... Um, there's, there's a lot of self-declared experts in this area. So you can buy um, from DuPont, you know, who produces masses of these different probiotic strains. So anybody here could say, okay, I'm going to create my own personalized um, probiotic cocktail, um, and you, you get... 10 of these and put them together and package them and sell them. And um, that's happening a lot. You know, so many of the things you see on the internet are created that way. 
without, <coughs> without any controlled study if this really does something. Um, so I, I personally say it's, you know, go with the more natural things, like the fermented foods and the, um, you know, fermented, I mean, including fermented dairy products. Um, I personally would, would not take pills. But. Please join me in thanking our speaker.